this on behalf of my friend Louis Paul. And fortunately, his, the interaction with uh, David Strauss, who is actually connected, I believe, and so uh, he can uh, participate in that listening to what we do and then certainly afterward perhaps even make comments if he, if he likes. Um, for my uh, presentation, I'd like to say first that a that, few uh, people helped me a lot with the presentation, but those of you who know me know that I'm kind of allergic to giving presentations. And, uh, but uh, David has helped a lot, John Lang has also helped shape the talk, and Marilyn, who has participated with me in this, in this process. But as the, I guess we have this is pointer and maybe not to get better practice. They instead looked at 
six orderly sequence limb leads, just as they looked at the six orderly sequence chest leads, but they did it in this vertical way. So that, as you can see, of course, minus ADR fit directly between lead one and lead two with a typical 30 degree between each. And this was a big surprise to me. I, I had no idea anybody uh, was so organized. So, as I have learned, this was the way we looked at the limb leads. One, two, three, leads R, E, L, and E, F. And of course, that meant that leads R was quite uh, looking from a view that was quite different than the typical views of the other leads. But as you can imagine, any lead has its antipodes or its, uh, or its um, reciprocal. And so ADR, which would be like so, also has a minus ADR, just as V1 has a positive V1 and a negative V1. But we don't think of the negatives of any of the leads, and therefore we think of the positives of all the leads, even though the positive of this lead is a view from a very different direction. In Sweden, however, they don't do that. And from 15 or so years before I began working with Ula, they routinely did, as I mentioned, go directly in a clockwise way from ADL around to three. And of course, you could go the other way, and some have gone the other way, but either way, uh, it's this orderly sequence. And so one question is then, of course, is this just of equal value, and it really doesn't matter, and you're as able to make diagnoses on the ECG if you use one method or the other, and the orderly sequence doesn't matter. Well, a lot of the odyssey is full of educating me that it does matter. And so not only does it matter in making diagnoses on an individual patient at that time, but it matters in being able then to evolve. Because instead of having the dead end to think only of the positive uh, views of any lead, as soon as you begin to think that each lead has two views, doors open. And the story of this odyssey is the story of a variety of these doors opening that have led in fact to the concept of electrocardiographic imaging. Now, as I mentioned, leads are simply views, and so if one looks at a uh, image, uh, such as a magnetic resonance image of a heart and the thorax, which you can hear from below, mm -hmm. then one can see that, in fact, going, uh, and you're looking at like that from below, one can see then V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6 uh, surfaces. Position, and you'll notice that V6, even though it's uh, mid axillary, actually is a view from slightly behind the middle of the heart. So it really is looking from behind. The positive of V6 is looking from behind, not just straight lateral. In fact, V5 is more clearly a, uh, to, uh, similar to a, to an X uh, uh, or lateral view. If we then look at the frontal plane, then of course it's similar, but now going along, uh, and here is of course a, a image, an image from a, a uh, uh, frontal view of, of the body and heart uh, from magnetic resonance imaging, and you can see the views that would be. Uh, and as, uh, well, so they're generally pointing the positive then views are generally from the left interior with lead, uh, lead three somewhat to the right. So that there have been a number of uh, papers written about lead, uh, lead ADR, lead minus ADR. And uh, this by uh, a group, including uh, Ula and I, was uh, from a pre presentation at ISCI meeting some years ago, and titled the Frontal Reflective Cardiogram, the Advantages of an Orderly Frontal Plane Lead Display 
including minus ADR. So maybe it's not just a different display, but maybe there's some advantages to that display. Well, one advantage is seen on this slide because this is a view of a patient who clearly has uh, who clearly has uh, SD segment changes. But when looking at a classical display, you see some SD depression, some SD elevation, and if one is asking the question about does this patient have does this patient have to be a patient with acute chest pain, and does this patient have an SD elevation by clinical function? Well, you can see the only lead with SD elevation is lead ADR. Uh, other leads show a lot of depression. And so this could be described as an EKG with an isolated SD elevation ADR. But if one looks then at the Cabrera sequence and puts the minus ADR in between the 1 and the 2, one sees there's nothing isolated at all. That when using minus ADR, there's a nice sequence. Now it doesn't happen to be any leads that are that have SD elevation. No. This patient does not have SD elevation in bark, but has a lot of SD depression, and we come to learn that these patients oftentimes have actually a main lab to a main lab equivalent. So they're, they're, they're happy with occlusion. It just happens to be such a proximal occlusion that they have a generalized subintercardial ischemia, and therefore they don't have really SD elevation in any, anywhere. And the SD elevation they are is really just another lead with SD segments moving away from the left ventricle and much in the same direction as would be the southern part of the scheme of a positive stress test, but a lot of it. So that would be one uh, advantage of putting the SD elevation and ADR in context and helping to understand what's really happening to this patient. Now, one way of, of emphasizing the difference would be if you imagine <laughs> trying to actually look at an individual in the way we looked at the disorderly sequence and trying to visualize the individual, we would see different views of the individual, but none of which added up to looking at the individual. On the other hand, if instead of that, we look at the orderly sequence of leads from, again, ADL around including minus ADR, we would see what looks like the frontal view of a person. So one can imagine all kinds of ways that there might be some advantage to the orderly sequence, but what are some of those advantages? Well. One thing that if any of us will talk about cardiography is the difficulty of getting any of our learners to understand how to calculate frontal plane axis. And I had the, uh, the pleasure of hosting uh, Ulis, Dr. Ulrika at Duke. Uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, I met Ulis in 1988 when he was doing a sabbatical, but into the 90s, Ulrika was in medical school, and she elected to come and work with me in the United States. And one of the things that she wanted to do was to investigate whether, in fact, there might be some advantages in uh, considering an orderly versus a disorderly sequence. And one of the things that we teach people uh, how to do is to calculate the frontal plane axis. And so, Ulrika had the hypothesis that this could be done hope better if individuals who knew nothing about the EKG were taught looking at the orderly sequence versus the classical sequence. And so she designed a study with undergraduates who had never seen an ECG before, but who were randomized to either be taught looking at the orderly or the traditional uh, standard sequence, and actually did the study and presented this at an ISTE meeting up the coast here a bit in Amelia Island in whatever year that the historians can tell us the Amelia Island meeting occurred. But she found in this study that there were two advantages. One was the students could then, in testing, calculate the frontal plane axis more rapidly, and two, more accurately. 
So there was an advantage in teaching using the ordering sequence as the display versus the, 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 the classical. Well, well, look, Orita stayed with me a period of time, and the next year, the ISPE meeting was in Chandler, Arizona, and she was quite disappointed that she had nothing to present and was not going to be there, and so she asked me if I would uh, do a little work for her. And that is she had come up with a new uh, hypothesis, and that was that even experts who might be attending uh, an ISPE meeting uh, never really, and then and look all routinely at the uh, at the conventional sequence, they never looked at the ABR, didn't pay any attention to it. And they read the read KG, and they basically just read the other reads, and they just ignored ABR. And so she uh, prepared a quiz and asked me if I would conduct this quiz at the ISCI meeting in Chandler. And uh, Fred Kornreich was the chair, and I went to Fred and asked for a little time to do this. And was anybody here? Is there anybody here who participated in that? In that well, a few people. And so we, uh, and so Ulrika had prepared five electrocardiograms that were challenged. Does this patient have a bubble branch block or an LVH? Does this patient have an anterior infarct or WDW, et cetera? And so I had the five electrocardiograms, and my job was to pass out uh, sheets that would be the answer sheet, and then ask people what their diagnosis was. And after they made their diagnosis, based on looking at the ECG, then I collected the sheets and asked the following questions. Well, her goal, I should say, was to actually write a manuscript that was called the standard 11 lead ECG because she hypothesized that these experts at ISP would pay no attention to the ABR and therefore she had replaced for all five of the examples the ABR with minus ABR. They never saw the ABR. And so in the position where you know one, two, three ABR, they saw minus ABR. So they never saw the ABR. But the following questions were asked. There are 35, 35 participants. And the first question was, and this was after they had we had collected the sheet, did you consider all 12 leads? Well, 26 said yes, and I said no, I don't think that did. Then we said, did you consider the ABR? And some said yes, some said no. We asked again, did you consider, I think I might have used the term really, did you really consider the ABR? And people said whatever. <laughs> and the next question was, did you notice that the ABR was reversed? Well, you can see of the 35 people, five, six, seven, seven people said they noticed that ABR was reversed and the others reported it. Not. And so consequently, as I said, uh, this was written into a manuscript which appears in the ISCI proceedings, and, and uh, the name of the manuscript is the Standard 11 Lead ECG. Um, now, would consideration of the minus ABR have improved diagnostic ability? That wasn't tested, but at least her hypothesis was proven in that even experts did not really look to see whether whatever it was in the position of the uh, ABR. Now, following this flurry of interest in the uh, lead minus ABR, there were a number of people who wrote uh, various papers in the literature, including in this one by Art Moss and colleagues, uh, about the consideration of lead minus ABR, and actually recommending that, not just in Sweden, but elsewhere, we change from the typical frontal plane display to the system in which the frontal plane as well, the frontal plane leads as well as the horizontal lead plane leads were indeed presented in an orderly way. Now this was not a new concept, and somebody pointed out that way back in 1951, a group at the Institute of Naval 
uh, station in Pensacola and threatened with others, had uh, actually written about the uh, the uh, the not just the orderly display of going from ADL to three, but actually including display of the negative lead that would complete the clock phase. And so in fact, in a one plane, as in here in the final plane, there would be 12 leads on the uh, cardiac electrical activity, not just six. And so we weren't coming up with anything new, who and I, in this process. And it had been considered uh, as something early, but wasn't adopted, and people paid really no attention to that. The next step was the question of, well, if you have two planes with orderly sequence leads, why not connect them? And is there some way to make some connection between an orderly sequence from the plane set of leads and an orderly sequence transverse set of leads. And the first uh, effort was a, a, a position paper that, uh, that uh, several of us worked together on. The lead author was Stan Anderson from Australia. And many of us, uh, maybe even some people probably in the room, were, uh, were, were participants. Um, and it was about this concept of a panoramic display of the orderly sequence of 12 leads so some way to connect the leads in the one plane with the leads in the other plane. And about that time, um, there was a uh, effort, and this was worked on by Ms. Krukov, and actually uh, uh, Jim Pope, who was here at this meeting, was the, uh, I guess you'd say, Jim, you were the, you were the uh, architect of the, uh, of the, uh, the illustration, what would you say? That was, but this was to be able, uh, in a three-dimensional way, to look at the amount of ST segment deviation, positively and negatively, at different points in time in the various leads. And to, to do this, you really needed to see the leads displayed in some orderly sequence and not just the lead in one plane. So in this case, the chest leads were presented to be six around the V1, and then the connection, and they were, the prop, there's proximity then between V1, this, this where the positive pole is pointed somewhat rightward, and V3. So then going around from V3 in a counterclockwise way to ADL. Of course, you could make, you could go either way in this, but in this particular, uh, uh, sequence, then the connection was made here. And when I talked to Jim about this a couple of weeks ago, Jim said, Oh, uh, did we use an orderly sequence? <laughs> it was, it was like, <laughs> well, I, oh, no, I think you said, Did, did, we, use, did we use minus ADR? <laughs> and so I said, Yeah. And so <laughs> remembering, but yes, as you can see, uh, uh, Jim did use minus ADR, as you would need to do if you're really going to have things orderly. So this was a move then. Uh, in going from just showing the orderly sequence in one plane that we all uh, were familiar with uh, to the uh, orderly sequence then in the other plane that only those in Sweden had been familiar with. So the question then came, if we're going to look at the various, if we're going to get the maximum information out of ECG, why not, why not consider um, all 24 views? So obviously each lead provides two views. So why not consider a 24 view ECG? And so again, uh, uh, Rick Paul uh, uh, was the first author of this particular paper, and Rick uh, Ula and Brian Dunphy, who was semester, and, and, and myself, with a new method for using the direction of ST segment deviation to localize the site of coronary occlusion. So this was a clear, potentially useful role of the electrocardiogram to be able to localize the site of the acute occlusion. And why not use all the views that the standard ECG provides? Because this is not by putting on additional leads, it's just looking at the at the at the two different views, positive and negative, of each lead that's provided. 
So that we decided to display this, and this is uh, full and I, uh, in, and this is very much like the old paper by you saw by Greninger, and this is the frontal plane, and looking at the 12 different views there, and then in the horizontal plane, and we took some liberty, of course, in the horizontal plane, because as you know, the Eiffel triangle really is not, it's not much contained, and so it's not just 30 degrees uh, between each of these here, so we took liberty over here to say, well, we don't know how many degrees there are between these different views, but we'll just pretend, again, that there's 30 degrees, and therefore we'll make a clock face much like this. So there's, there's, there's license, and we're not arguing that in fact there are 30 degrees between each of these, but again, we're looking with the heart in the middle and showing how we really do have a total of 24 views, and this particular individual the question comes, does this patient have, this is a patient with chest pain, and does this patient have indeed ST elevation compression? Well, you can see there's no ST deviation significantly at all in the frontal plane. But in the transverse plane, you see depression in V1, V2, V3, V4, and people would say, well, this is anterior subendocardial cardiac ischemia, or something of that sort. And if they want to see more, Maybe there's something going on in the back wall, they would put electrodes on the back, but you don't really need to. What you can do is just, you just, you can do the same thing by holding the paper up, the light turning it upside down, but why not just construct the antipode? And you can see in this case, there is ST elevation in, uh, in minus uh, V2, well, some in minus V1, minus V2, maximum in minus V3, some in minus V4. So this patient is indeed having an ST centered elevation in margin. Due to the occlusion of guess what? A non dominant left circumflex. But it's happening to have their occlusion someplace that's not going to show ST elevation in even one beat of the standard 12, let alone two contiguous. But if we don't pay attention to this, we're going to say, oh, this patient's not having standard. This patient's having something else. Let's not even think about this patient with chest pain as having an acute occlusion. So it's another place where, in fact, uh, not just the orderly sequence, but expanding from the orderly sequence of considering just here to around the clock face, one does have as value in the next cardiogram. Next question that Ulla and I asked was, well, is there value in all 24 views? Or in fact, as you begin to add views, do you, do you uh, indeed uh, fail to increase uh, sensitivity and begin to decrease specificity. So we had uh, patients that, had, that, that did and didn't have acute occlusion. So we had groups that were doing positive and doing negative. And what we found was, if you consider a 12 lead, you have 4% false positives, and you have 60% sensitivity. As you add beyond 12, of course the maximum is 24, you really begin to increase sensitivity up to 70% and you decrease specificity a bit, of course, but only down to about 93%. As you go beyond 19, however, you now begin to uh, increase, decrease specificity without further increasing sensitivity. So we then arrived at the concept of 19 leads, 19 views that in fact would be potentially useful. And, and so would lead out then, would have gaps because Consideration of those views would, in fact, potentially add uh, decreased specificity without increasing sensitivity. And here we have two examples. This patient, much like before, now has the ST elevation as you can see here. This patient has the same ST elevation, but in addition has ST elevation in two contiguous frontal plane leads. Now, what are those two leads? Well, they're certainly not one in ABL, because one has no elevation at all, but indeed they're ABL, I'm sorry, ABL and minus three. Well, who considers minus three a view that anybody paid attention to? And if you're only looking at the, at the standard of views, you'd say, well, this patient has ST elevation in one V. There's nothing contiguous. This patient doesn't have ST elevation anything. Uh, but in fact, there is, there is an adjacent lead, a contiguous lead, that has elevation. This just doesn't happen to be a positive lead. It happens to be negative three. And obviously the same thing could have happened on the other side. <coughs> now,
Now, this uh, is a illustration that uh, John Wang provided me from uh, Phillips, and this is a uh, obviously a, a busy looking uh, display, but it is a, it is a bedside monitor uh, display that Phillips uses that has many things on it that I won't go into all the different parameters, but you can see here it has uh, it's a 20, there's 12 means of monitoring, there's actually a very CCG means of SC elevation, and out here there's a listing of the amount of SC sector deviation in each lead. Well, this is very difficult since since that there's no, this is not a graphic display uh, for the clinician at the bedside to be able to comprehend what's really happening. And so uh, uh, John and, and his colleagues then developed the following, which is an SD map. And the way the SD map works is here's, of course, the uh, standard ECG in its sort of sequence. And uh, there is SD elevation, as you can see. But if you then map that, you find that indeed the SC segments are deviating inferiorly in the frontal plane and posteriorly, or to, toward the so called lateral myocardium, in the transverse plane. And so you're able to show by this map, which could in fact take the place then of the wave. And indeed, in the, in the Phillips display, then uh, John has incorporated the ST map into the Phillips display. And Further, has produced a uh, a uh, application called a steady map in which indicates the spatial regions in which ST segment deviation would uh, produce what would be called ST elevation MI in both the frontal and the transverse plane, and you can see that this particular patient would have uh, steady uh, criteria here, but. Since this is somebody with a uh, probably a right coronary occlusion who has both uh, inferior and posterior lateral involvement, the ST segment deviation of the transverse plane is away from, and therefore would be ST depression seen by these means and only seen as elevation if one considers a negative view. But this is the ST map um, image, and uh, John and his colleagues then, uh, and we did a collaboration uh, with the ULA and uh, investigators in New York to develop this, I came up with an image uh, based on the SD segment, not uh, only the waveforms and certainly not only the measurements. Now, at this time, I'd like to uh, uh, break from the slide presentation to present about a minute or so of a video that uh, was developed from, based on another, an investigator named Bill Olson, who many of you know, and Bill has worked uh, in his retirement years, retirement from his, his job he did for many years, is considering the electrocardiogram and developing a concept of heart to root to leads, which as you can imagine is, we talk about the inverse solution, this would be the direct solution, going from the heart to the vector loop to ECG leads. And so uh, Dave's going to show, oh, Soko is going to show uh, a brief part of the video. Now, let me give you one little history of the video. In the one of the things that I enjoy this video demonstrates how to visualize the ECG in three dimensions. Okay, one second. The left ventricle oh, is shown in blue with its depolarization wave front moving through the Um they they worked with me on the twelfth to write the twelfth edition of the Marriott book, and we had added a chapter on the spatial electrocardiograms, and in that chapter we were able to include videos. And so what you're going to hear and see is about the first minute of a four minute video that is of Olson's method but narrated by Dave and it shows how one can go then from the heart to the vector root to the lead. So sorry, Tom. Yeah, the heart in red. Let's go back and to the way back front to activates the heart. Oh, no, the vector root is drawn. Can we go back to the beginning of the, it's just, yeah. Dave can help. Sorry. This video demonstrates how to visualize the ECG in three dimensions. In the ADF, are displayed, as these leads are at right angles to each other. In the horizontal plane, leads V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6 are indicated in their anatomical position. The ECG signals for lead V2 and V5 
are displayed, which are also at right angles to each other. Before looking at the connection between the loops and the leads, let's put a stop there. I didn't want to go through the entire video, but just to show you how um, there could actually be the the looking at images all the way from the electricity going through the heart to how it would show up on the electrocardiogram to then how one would see it in the different ECG reads. And so the uh, video goes longer, but I just wanted to show the very first part of the video to show how this could happen. But again, using the orderly sequence of these so that uh, we're, we're really going with minus ADR, not using uh, ADR, and of course the orderly sequence in the transverse plane. If you can just go back to the slide. <coughs> now, the uh, Ron Sylvester is known to uh, many of you, and he developed and presented uh, many times in these meetings about his QRS story for estimating uh, in part size. Uh, Joey Ubox, uh, a young investigator from the Netherlands, took that same Sylvester distribution method for distributing QRS changes or departures into the different parts of the heart and did so with the ST segments. And so Ron had uh, liked using a Mercator view in which the different quadrants of the left ventricle are laid out as so. Anterior, anterior superior, posterior lateral, and inferior. And here we see how ST segment deviating toward an area would be distributed. So this would be for someone with an LED occlusion, someone with an LCX occlusion, a non-dominant LCX, and someone with a white carter occlusion. Now if you can do this looking at a, at a Mercator view, you can certainly then put the apices together and look at the quadrants uh, now with the apices leading in a bullseye view. And the advantage of this, of course, is this is the way the various other kinds of imagers tend to look at the heart as a bullseye rather than a Mercator view. If you consider, though, the uh, Mercator view, this uh, uh, was developed, again, using the Sylvester method, in which for a patient with an occlusion of a mid LED, one could then make a display that shows the myocardium affected and by this is a particular electrocardiogram somewhere in the course of the patient's course with acute uh, evolution of infarction, in which based upon the, QR, the QRS changes, one would say, well, we can distribute the infarction like so, but based on the ST segment changes, we can distribute the ischemia like so, and so this might be the entire risk region, and then unless there's, unless there's salvage, then infarction might go all the way, but perhaps reperfusion and removing the obstruction might limit the infarct here and might in fact salvage this. I mean, okay. So, um, the last uh, presentation, the last slide is the same uh, information, but now looking at a variety of patients with LED occlusion and looking at this ECG image based on the SC <laughs> in comparison with SPEC and in comparison with the MRI. The final illustration is now using uh, Milan Horchek and John uh, put together this thing called computer, computer ECG imaging based on inverse solution. So instead of just painting something in the one area of the heart, based on inverse solution, being able to use to see where the electrocardiogram then uh, indicates the, uh, the, uh, the speed. Here, it's someone with LED occlusion, and in comparison with spec, here is someone with LCX, and here is someone with right occlusion. So this then completes the odyssey, uh, which by definition is either considered extended, adventurous voyager trip, or intellectual or spiritual quest, and it's certainly something Ula and I have enjoyed over this long period of time. Thank you.
Ula, can you hear us? Ula, are you still there? Computer? Alright, okay. Several things now. Because of the power. No, he's here. Uh, all right, you're, you're, you're talking into the microphone. Uh, Hello, everyone. Welcome um, to Florida. I'm sorry you're not here, but I'm glad you're feeling better. It's fall. Um, we enjoyed the presentation. We spent a wonderful odyssey. Um, um, there are about 100 people here um, waiting for you to say um, something. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we appreciate all of your work in the past, and I think um, Gavin did a wonderful job of presenting, uh, presenting um, the perspective from, from both of you, um, as well as your, your colleagues over the years. Um, we're sorry you can't be here, uh, but uh, it's good to speak with you, and I hope to see you again next year um, in San Jose, if not sooner. I hope to see you there. Good. Bye.